There can be no doubt of the season of death and despair, um, which has marked the last three years. In the time since we were all in this venue, so much has changed in our country and in the world, and so many of us have lost so much and so many because of the pandemic. We all suffered differently, and we all suffered the same, and we all suffered separately, and we're all suffering together in the same place, but separated sometimes so permanently from so many different people. Um, the pandemic showed us that we weren't ready. We weren't ready to work together. We weren't ready to share, whether there were vaccine doses or anything else. We weren't really ready to respond to the pandemic. We weren't ready to say goodbye to our workplaces. We weren't ready to save the lives of so many people that we lost to maybe, if it were to happen again, we could have saved. But so much happened for the good. There was incredible work by nurses, by doctors, by the NICD, by the health department, by SAPRA, by so many other organizations, the people who designed ventilators, the people who brought us the first vaccines. And it is because of their work that we're actually back here today. So then, how do we prepare for the next pandemic? How do we make sure that never again in my life will I have to wake up to check WhatsApp to see who I know has died in the eight hours that I've been asleep? Moderating this panel, Tim Tucker is the CEO of ASEAD Consulting and adjunct associate professor of health at the School of Public Health at UCT. Uh, he's joined by Professor Koleka Imlasana, uh, Executive Director of the National Health Laboratory Services and co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Professor Glenda Gray is the pre President of the South African Medical Research Council. And Precious Matsoso is a former Director General in the Department of Health, a former WHO Director of Public Health Innovation, and now Chair of the WHO Executive Board. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be here today with this amazing group of friends and colleagues who have the most astonishing views on the pandemic, on health around the world. They have intersecting views on global issues, national issues, implementation issues, research issues, and we're going to have a, what I hope will be a rollicking conversation rather than a question and answer session on how we might find solutions based on what we've learned from the last almost three years of the COVID pandemic. Precious, you have a very diverse view on, on health, having been Director General of Health, and as Stephen has spoken about, you have also had a very profound role at a World Health Organization and with the global, multi, uh, uh, global entities like the United Nations. Perhaps to set the scene before we start looking at some of the short-term solutions and medium-term solutions, you can give something that stood out for you in this pandemic that the multilateral organizations got right and maybe something where they were lacking? Yes, uh, thank you very much and thank you, um, uh, Maverick, for inviting me for this uh, important event. I think the first thing is about the multilateral system that has been created. I mean, countries agreed to an international legal instrument referred to as international health regulations. But it's quite clear that when COVID happened, there were delays, firstly, there was hesitancy, but there was also delayed movement. And that came because of the nature of the instrument itself. The instrument is created in such a way that they must take steps, consult the country, and hear from the country, verify. Now, for a, you know, a viral pathogen that moves so fast, it can't wait for those steps. So it is from that perspective that this instrument is conservative, it needs to be changed, it needs to be amended. And that's the very important process that is underway. But that's not the only thing. The other thing is that the instrument is lacking in a sense that we witnessed inequities in terms of the distribution of vaccines, of diagnostics. Some countries could not respond timely because they did not have access to medical supplies when they were needed. And because of that, we have pushed to have a pandemic treaty. 
so that countries can be held accountable, but also we can ensure that there's technology transfer and production in those countries and regions where access was a barrier. But I must hasten to say that there are certain positive things that happened. We have not seen research and development happen at such unprecedented pace. In addition, we've not seen the sharing of scientific information on digital platforms in a manner that has happened with COVID. And it's the basis on which we should build on these digital platforms to enhance our surveillance. But there's other things that I would like to underscore. Much as we say the instrument may be a problem, but there was also a problem in the manner in which countries responded. There were countries who were swift, who responded early, who responded comprehensively. So in the assessment that we did of 28 countries, but there were others who were tardy, who devalued science, and who also undervalued health workers. They also did not recognize the enormity of the problem. Some played wait and see. But as they played wait and see, the virus did not wait. It just ravaged, as we all know what the consequences have been. So from that perspective, it's important that one, countries learn from those who did better. And those who did better did a couple of things. Firstly, they had engagement of communities. You know, outbreaks start in communities and they end in communities. So if you leave your communities behind, your response will be slow, it will be delayed, and you will not be effective. The second is about investment in the work health, the work health force so that you can ensure that there's such capacity. You don't invest during outbreaks. You invest during peace times. And the significance of that is that your investments must be investment in preparedness. So we saw underinvestment, gross underinvestment in preparedness across the world. And I think it's one area where you'd like to improve and improve significantly. Thank you, Precious. Koleka Mnesana, such a critical role you've played in the National Health Laboratory Service and as the co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Can you just give one standout of something positive that happened that we might be able to leverage in, as learning for future pandemic preparedness? Sure. Thank you very much, Tim, and thanks. It's great to participate in these conversations, because I think also these are needed conversations. And thanks, Precious, for some of the points you have raised. Because, I mean, just uh, stemming from what you said, you talk about a swift response that's necessary. I think that is probably one of the few things that we did well as a country, in that we, there was this swift um, response in establishing structures to assist in the response against the pandemic. Well, you know, uh, whether it was an incident management uh, uh, team of the government, the IMT, or for that matter, establishing the ministerial advisory committees, because what that then did, it ensured that the response to the pandemic was scientifically driven. It was science driven and data driven. But the second thing, which I also want to couple with that, was because of some of the investments that had already been there within the country. And for me, the highlight was you need the data to get a better understanding of the, of the pandemic and also how to respond. And the fact that we already had a laboratory system where testing was accessed and we knew exactly how many tests were done each day. And this was not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector. So that allowed you know, quick gathering of the data. We could assess where we were, what needed to be done. And for me, that's one of the things, you know, good things that were done. 
the, I'll throw in the last one, is that the establishment of the Solidarity Fund actually really was a, a, a positive because there was an entity outside of government wherein you know, a lot of business put in you know, a, a monies to assist in that. So for me, those are just some of the critical things that I feel were responded swiftly. And yeah. Thank you, Kuleka. So Glenda, if I reflect back on the last uh, two and a half years and look to the superheroes of the response in this epidemic, it's enriched by the researchers. The researchers played a disproportionate role in responding to this epidemic, whether it be the Tony Fauci's in the US, the Glenda Gray's, the Slim Karim's, the, 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 the many researchers who were involved in HIV and TB and other research before then who then pivoted to COVID. Can you give an equivalent kind of answer in that sector around maybe a good, and a, a, a good learning area for future pandemics? Sure, our investment in science paid off. Um, over the years, over the last two, two decades, we've spent a, lot of infrastructure, spent a lot of time developing clinical and laboratory research around TB and HIV, and those scientists were able to pivot directly into, um, into COVID and be responsive. And I'll give two examples of how HIV and TB helped the, the pandemic. Um, we had developed, um, when, I, when I first became the president of the MRC, these, these chaps from UWC came to visit me, and they had this um, HIV uh, resistance uh, platform that they wanted to develop. And we invested in, in this, this platform, and this platform was later used for TB resistance. And then when COVID came along, this was the platform that we used to identify all the variants of concern. It's called Exotype. And this, this platform is used in about 57 countries around the world and was used by GISAID and allowed us to upload all the data and the reason why we could uh, uh, d discover beta and Omicron. So if it wasn't for the work that we'd done in HIV in 2014, we wouldn't have been able to do this and help um, people at a global level. The other thing is, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were no diagnostics. We had no PCR materials. Uh, the planes had stopped, in, and we were desperate. And the MRC uh, paid 750,000, the best 750,000 rand we've ever spent. <laughs> we gave it to a TB, um, uh, a TB, a TB uh, researcher, and he um, cultured SARS-CoV-2 in his lab. And when he got the, the culture, his hands were shaking like this. Um, but this, this culture helped us establish a, a platform to compare um, all tests in the future and to be able to make our SARP be able to approve our, our rapid diagnostics and other diagnostics. And this investment we used in 27 countries across the world and in about nine African countries. So it's about the investment. And so the, my, my lesson about science is that we have to continue to invest in science, both clinical and laboratory, because that's our best way to respond to a pandemic. So as we develop the solutions, we have to reflect that the world as a whole, not this country, the world as a whole over the last few decades has invested less and less in public health structures. And so when COVID came along, it was as if we were, the f we were watching a fire come towards us and the fire brigade needed to be staffed, we needed to check the fire engines, we needed to check the comms, and we were in crisis mode because of the underinvestment over decades. And Kuleka, as we learn from that, what, what recommendations would you have for this country around public and private infrastructure that we need to invest in now so that we are prepared for the next fire? Sure. Th thanks, Tim. In fact, the one point that I did not raise earlier on is where we failed. In that, if one looks at um, all the positives that I mentioned, but one area was a gap that really just became so glaring, and that was in our health system, the health system infrastructure. We continued with every wave that came about. We just could not cope because whether it's the infrastructure itself of our hospitals, our clinics, whether it's you know, uh, human resources, whether it's supplies, and that was very uh, glaring. Now, what do we then need to do so firstly, there's a lot that we have learned and there's a significant um, resources that have been built. And I'll go back to, because really right now we're in a period of you know, a season in between. Now, what's going to be important, you will not find anything that you don't look for. And that's why surveillance becomes critical. So at the moment, we have um, the, the NHLS as a, 
entity and it's got the institutes of communicable diseases and you know, occupational health which operate within the bigger entity. But as a country, we need a very clear structure that's going to be looking at public health interventions. So we need a national structure that must be well-defined, well-designed, and most importantly, well-funded. That's then going to continue the surveillance work that NICD is doing. So we need to keep on at surveillance because when we have that body, then we are going to be able to pick up anything that might come in between. And that body might, must not just be about surveillance, but they must be able to have a quick response. Should there be a need for a response, there must be systems in place for such a response. So for me, it would be to say, right now, let's fund what has worked to, well and let's make sure that it's, it's, it's sustained you know, in the funding. The other critical, um, which talks to data as well was how we're able to establish a hospital, you know, clinical data surveillance, which is what we call DEADCOV, which we did not have before COVID. And so that's really critical. It must not just be about COVID-19, but the DEADCOV system must actually be operated across all, you know, diseases in the country because then it gives us a clear you know, um, sense of where we are at. And then there's got to be data integration. So it must not just be, you know, pockets of data that are kept separately, but there's got to be linkages. We've seen how even the, you know, the electronic, you know, vaccination system has worked in. So let's tap in uh, onto that. The second thing I would say is important is, Within health, there has been a huge challenge of establishing a unique identifier for patients in South Africa. And for some reason, we just can't get ourselves around establishing that. And I think this is a time where we need to have very clear guidelines. How do we end up with a clear, unique identifier, patient identifier system? Because that makes, a, 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 it actually, catapults when you are in, in health because it doesn't matter where patients go to across the country, we'll be able to, to, to have clean data. So I would say we must strengthen that. We have seen how genomic surveillance really just brought the country in, into, the fore, into the fore. That must be funded and it must continue. So really for me it would be to look at the surveillance systems, we look at the information systems because that's going to be critical when we meet and hit the next pandemic. So those would be some. And, and most importantly, we, you know, the, the health system could not cope with the waves because it is not strong, it's actually very weak. And so we need to see how do we ex strengthen the currently existing, I mean, everybody talks about the health system in the Gauteng, you know, province. We've got to fix that. And there must be commitment, there must be funding, and we must identify people who have got the skill who are going to do the work and do it properly. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. We can talk about preparedness. If we don't fix what's currently happening, we won't get anywhere. So, Glenda, you are the president of the premier biomedical research organization in the country. But I would imagine that there is critique around the fact that we might not have invested enough research into the diversity of research areas that affect people in pandemics. Economic research, educational research, the, the diversity in that space. Can you give some sense maybe about where we were lacking? So I think that's a critical thing. So although we were very strong in, in, in health, health with clinical science and, and laboratory, we failed to understand um, some of the economic impacts that um, our mitigation strategies had, uh, like lockdown, the effect of lockdown on, on, on both um, our economy, um, the household food security, as well as the impact we, it had on children who couldn't go to school. So that was an important aspect to it. Um, uh, we also failed to understand the lack of trust of, of, of Western medicine, for instance. And so when we did roll out the vaccine, um, we were we were surprised by um, the, the vaccine hesitancy at a global level. And, um, and although we have very good rates of, of infant immunizations in this country, um, adult uptake of vaccination was much less, which means that we have to do a lot more work to understand the cultural and, and sociological issues uh, around pandemics, issues around uh, gender-based violence and issues around um, the, the, the mental health and, and the trauma, the post-traumatic stress disorder that a pandemic can, uh, can do. So we have to also invest in, um, in other 
areas to be able to, to manage and understand the epidemic. There were some good surveys that happened um, during waves, during the pandemic, the, the NITS, CRAMS surveys that looked at um, some of the economic health and, and other aspects to it, which were very important and help, um, was a good instrument to help us guide us to what was happening um, in South Africa. So a lot more investment in that should happen. Thank you. Precious, I look at uh, COVAX, the mechanism set up by Gavi, World Health Organization, and others where countries bought into this incredible vision of having an organization that was there to receive vaccines and distribute to the poor, na poor nations, and yet it failed. Uh, there was what we see in global uh, vaccine distribution was the rich retained stocks and the poor, to d even today, have a few stocks of vaccines. Can you talk a little bit about your view from a, 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 these multilateral organizations? Talking about how we might change the thinking, the ethics, the, the ways of practicing as it relates to intellectual property, product access, uh, distribution, not only of the vaccines, but of, of intellectual property and methods so that others can manufacture as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I think COVAX, uh, uh, is, is a pillar of Act Accelerator. As you know, Act Accelerator was created to support research and development, and it, it was created as part of the blueprint that emerged from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. But it wasn't enough to just look at research and development. You also have to look at access. So I always say that Access and innovation are two sides of the same coin. So if you address research and development and you neglect access, we'll end up with what we had with inequitable distribution of vaccines. Because on one hand, Act Accelerator had this unprecedented R&D process for vaccines, and of course, they were also looking at repurposing some of the therapeutics. So we, we have recognized that in addition to just looking at R&D, we also have to address access, and of course, WHO created what is called CTEP. CTEP was intended to look at, firstly, IP issues, the um, the, 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 the distribution and supply chain issues, uh, training, regulatory issues, and as we know, um, the emergency use initiatives and pathways were created during this process. But that did not help to get vaccines to the arms in some of the countries. So the debates that have been going on led to this movement that is calling for the creation, development of a negotiated legally binding instrument. And this legally binding instrument that can be in a form of a treaty or a convention is probably what is desired because it cannot be that in South Africa in particular, we've traveled this journey of fighting for access for antiretrovirals. And a couple of years later, we come back, it's the same debate, it's about access, but this time in the middle of a crisis for vaccines. So what is intended with this instrument is that we've looked at four key thematic areas. One is about governance. I know that we've not necessarily discussed governance. But our view is that governance must be addressed at a global level to deal with a global health architecture. Secondly, it should be addressed at regional level to look at how you bring different stakeholders to deal with not only access issues, but everything. But it, not, it must not be window dressing. And it should also happen at national level. So we need to deal with governance and because this has to do with the interdependence, interdependence between government, between uh, communities, as well as researchers and the private sector. 
So we need to deal with governance. The second is about equity. So we have looked at all aspects of equity that needs to be addressed. So we are saying that in this pandemic treaty, in this legally binding instrument, we should incorporate equity issues and ensure that this never happens again. The third is about systems and tools, and I'm glad that both Glenda and colleagues spoke about health systems issues because we need to integrate them and make this binding to governments and ensure that during peace times there are investments in preparedness. And the last one is about financing. Financing is not just about global financing. In fact, what we said during this pandemic, when vaccines could not be moved to the arms, because firstly, COVAX did not succeed because funding was not available and there was hoarding and vaccine nationalism. So we said that G7 countries have an obligation to make money available. They should invest 60% of what was needed. And we said in addition, the G20 should pay the difference. But we said we do not want this dependency culture to occur. What is needed is that to just deal with this gap G7, G20 countries must make those investments so that we get vaccines to the arms. But going forward, countries must start making investments so that there's ownership and every country can bear responsibility for investment both globally and nationally so that we have a global system that is funded, that is sustainable. But also, that keeps WHO independent because we've seen geopolitics if WHO does certain things, certain countries suppress it, threatens. So we need a mechanism by which WHO can be funded in an independent manner and without fear or favor. Scientists in WHO can do their work. Thank you. So you mentioned the issue of robust health systems and I'm gonna come back to Koleka and ask her view on that in a moment. But one thing is for sure is that it's not will there be another pandemic, it's when is the next pandemic. And it may be next week, it may be next month, it may be in 25 years. And I think that as a global community, we must be voting for whoever we want in power, but whoever it is, they should be investing in research and systems, not over an election cycle, but over a long period, a 10, 15, 20, 25 year period. And so we've now discussed some of the more crisis-related solutions that may be applicable, and now I want to sort of pivot to something more long-term and come back to you, Glenda, and ask, within the context of these superstars that responded to the pandemic that we are, seem to be emerging from now, if you would look, were to look at a 20, 25-year uh, window and say, what are the investments that the global community should be making in research to be even more prepared down the line? That's critical. So, uh, first of all, I think the values of, of, of science must be that it must be open access, there must be collaboration, and um, we must, have, we must be, have data sharing. And so investment in science is, imp is imperative for um, a, a response to the pandemic. And I'll go back just quickly to, to, to show some of the, the, the principles we used um, during COVID, the COVID pandemic. On the 3rd of March, the Department of Science and Innovation, DG, phoned me, and I was boarding a plane on the way from Cape Town, from Durban to Cape Town. And he said, Glenda, what's our strategy for COVID? What's our research strategy? And I said, DG, I'm on a plane, and when I get, get off, um, I'll, I'll send you something. And that, that two-hour uh, trip made me focus, and those principles will, will take me forward forever. I knew that we had to do surveillance, and Koleka has, has, has spoken about the importance of surveillance. So genomic surveillance, so we can identify these, these variants. The, the issue of hospital surveillance, so we can see that um, <coughs> the, the, patient, the, the profile of patients are changing. There's an excess of respiratory illnesses, pneumonia, unexplained pneumonia. So we need astute um, hospital records, because that's how we picked up the pandemic in the past. Um, we had um, uh, uh, doctors in China that had this couldn't explain unexplained pneumonia. So we need good systems, good instruments in hospitals to pick out outbreaks of gastroenteritis or pneumonia. We need wastewater surveillance. 
and this is and to pick up um, pathogens or anything that's happening in the wastewater. And we started doing wastewater surveillance in South Africa, and we were horrified by the, the sewage systems in our country, and that's, that must continue our wastewater. The excess deaths is very important. We're one of the only countries in Africa that can count deaths and, and can understand year in and year out how death is changing, how the ages, the rates of, of, of death change. And that's important in case it is a, a, um, a, a pathogen that affects children or people in their 20s like HIV or, or like COVID. So I think that's a very important thing. So you know, invest in surveillance. Invest in diagnostics. We heard the importance of investing. We had no diagnostics. We had to make our own plan. And so we have to continue to invest in diagnostics. And this is what we did right from the beginning of the pandemic. The important is, as well as, um, is collaborate and invest in, in vaccine development and manufacturing. And very early on, we knew that we didn't have the, the, the money, the big bucks, to make vaccines in this country. So we very quickly collaborated with international partners so that we could conduct vaccine trials and be able to use our, our knowledge to, to understand how to roll out um, COVID vaccines and other therapeutics. So I think it's important that we have to invest in, in vaccine R&D and drug R&D so that we can make drugs, antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, and vaccines in the future. We have to invest in our basic science. So we have the, most, we have the best basic scientists in Africa and, and in, my, in my opinion in, in the world, who could respond and understand the immunology um, of, of, of COVID, understand the interplay between HIV, TB and, and, the, um, and, and COVID, understand neutralizing antibodies, understand neutralizing escape. So invest in basic science and that's going to be important. And um, we also have to invest in, in human resource, capacity development. We need scientists. You know, we need to grow. If we, if we have future pandemics or the next pathogen X, we have to have a, a caterer of scientists that can respond. We can't stop investing in, 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 in making or developing scientists. And also we have to finally, we have to understand an investment in what, what these pandemics have, the impact it has on society. So those are my lessons and they kept us going throughout the pandemic, um, and that's how we funded, uh, together with the Department of Science and Innovation, our response to, to COVID, and how we would do the, the future responses. Thank you. So Precious, one of the questions from Bonsai Matuka is how effective were the vaccines in the fight against COVID? And I'm gonna answer that and then give you the follow-up. The answer to that is that the COVID vaccines were a phenomenal success, and when you measure vaccine success, it's how often vaccinated people are, are protected against infection. But as important, are the vaccinees protected against serious disease and death? And while we've seen a diminishing with the newer variants of COVID in the vaccine's ability to prevent infection, they remain spectacular at preventing severe disease and death. So, Bonsai, that's the answer to your question with regard to effectiveness of vaccines. But Precious, what I wanted to ask you is how we start to increase the trust in science. Because despite having a, an amazing set of vaccines available for COVID, sometimes uptake in some communities was poor. And the trust in science maybe was not what it could be. Could you talk maybe about how we could prepare in the coming decades to re-engage communities to have greater trust in, what, in, in the answer to this kind of question from Bonsai? Yes, thank you very much. I, I'd like to start from uh, the scientist <laughs> and say that we need citizen science. And, and the reason being that actually we've just published a paper about citizen science and specifically because the, the, the trust deficit is between citizens and government, it's between citizens and scientists, and it's between citizens themselves. So, so we need to, to deal with that and understand the science. The, the second is about having what we call pandemic literacy. And I must applaud uh, 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 you know, mainstream media in that they brought science to citizens, knowingly or unknowingly. What the difference is it made is that citizens were able to get results from science. So we need to build on that and see how citizens can get 
scientific results, outcomes from mainstream media. The third is about misinformation. And if citizens trust government, government communicates effectively in a noble manner and in an honest manner, I think that builds trust. When we assess the 27 countries, we identify those countries where citizens were able to listen to government, were able to respond. But in other countries where there was suppression, where there was techno surveillance, where digital platforms were actually not used for contact tracing, but were used as techno surveillance, citizens were not uh, trusting. So, so we need to look at those. But bring other sciences into the fold, like behavioral scientists, anthropologists, because in West Africa, when we had the Ebola outbreaks, it is anthropologists who are able to communicate with citizens. But like I said, outbreaks start in communities and they end in communities. So from the very onset, you start engaging communities. Thank you. So we have just over five minutes, and I have a set of questions coming through over here as well. And so I'm going to mix and match a bit of the questions and, the, and, and some of the other things. And Koleka, one of, the, one of the questions comes up around how we deal with the big number of people who are suffering from long COVID who are going to put, put an additional burden on our overstretched health systems already. And it relates to another question that I wanted to ask you, which is maybe one of the toughest things for government, which already has an overburdened health system with not enough infrastructure, not enough staff, etc. How do we create in the future, over the next few decades, an expandable resource so that when that pandemic hits us next time around, we're able to expand and not just in crisis mode, but have a structured plan that the fire brigade can respond to and make sure that we can treat the people who are acutely ill and now, as the question came in now, those that have the long-term sequelae of illness as well. And we do have some time limits. Okay. Thanks, Tim. And I mean, as you say, that's a very difficult question, especially because we are struggling currently to actually have a working health system. So, so how do we then create an easily expanded system into the future? I, I guess the, the, the important thing, there's got to be commitment in that that's what we need. And for me, there's no commitment without financial commitment. Can we then, as a country, establish you know, uh, finances that are going to be looking at that expandable you know, uh, system? And where do we need that expansion? Is it going to be at infrastructure first? How do we come up with you know, filled hospitals? Should we need them at the, you know, when there's a crisis? Can we ensure that there are resources that are put aside, ring-fenced for such, to be able to create those hospitals within a very short space of time? The biggest challenge as well becomes the human resources. We are struggling currently with human health you know, uh, resources in that we just don't have enough capacity in our hospitals. And so can we, how do we then prepare for that? And obviously, if we're looking at preparedness, we can't have... A, a, you know, an army of you know, uh, healthcare workers that are kept aside that will become available. But what becomes important right now, how do we identify where to source those individuals? Do we look at retirees? We kept, you know, like a, a clear documentation and records or who is available, who can do what? So we need an assessment of available skill, assessment of retired healthcare workers that could be called unto whenever there's a need. And even, for instance, with uh, access to to, to consumables and, you know, can we begin now? I mean, I, I hear Precious talking about this treaty. Can we include in that treaty certain agreements as to when we then require equipment to actually fit into those, you know, uh, filled hospitals that will be created? Will we have agreements to access, you know, su 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 such um, infrastructure? Will we have agreements that will allow us to get the consumables that we will require? So really, but the first and most important thing is going to be 
making funding available for that, committing to that, and then planning in advance and identifying where to source those expandable systems that we can use when a need arises. And quickly, do you mm -hmm. think the investment in NHI, the, the attempt to improve primary health care facilities and infrastructure to be able to respond to general health issues yeah. is going to be part of pandemic preparedness as well? A brief answer? Yeah. We need to strengthen our primary health care system. As to how we do that, or whether the NHI is the right vehicle, that's a discussion for another day. But really, what's clear right now, there's need to properly invest in our primary health care system. Thank you. You will see that for those of you online who have been submitting questions and those here that um, are trying to weave your questions in but won't get through all the questions. Glenda, we have one and a half minutes. One of the questions I think is central is can we measure country preparedness into the future? Can you give us a, a, a quick answer on measuring preparedness? So the first thing to measure is the money that's given to primary preparedness, and this must be with good governance, and you must be able to account what you use your money for. So money, we need money. We need systems in hospitals where we can see what's happening, who's being admitted for how long, who's dying, and where they're dying. So we need good data-driven hospital systems, which are resilient, as Kaleka said. We need R&D investment. We need vaccine manufacturing. Whatever vaccine we can make so we can pivot to the vaccine if we need it for pathogen X. We need, we need um, um, uh, investment in, in acute pharmaceutical ingredients so we can make um, the monoclonals and the antivirals that I spoke about. We can measure patents. So that's a measure of science. How many discoveries are we making in the scientific area in, in South Africa or in other in innovations? So patent um, observation, um, the issue around um, Pathogen X will come because of climate change, so we need environmental surveillance, which includes wastewater. But how is our climate changing? What are the zoonotic diseases? What are we doing with, with animal farming um, and exotic farming of animals? So we have to do surveillance, both in terms of climate and environment. And finally, we need to make sure our regulators are ready. So it must take, uh, once, you, once there is a, a diagnostic, it must take 10 days to approve that diagnostic so we can use it. So a regulatory environment that's responsive to um, emergencies. Thank you. I know you were very rushed in that answer. And so time is up, and I'd just like to thank the panel here, uh, thank the audience and the questions, and, and thank you very much. <laughs>